Did you know? There's been many video game hoaxes involving Sonic the Hedgehog over the years. In the 11th issue of the UK version of Sega magazine, the outlet claimed that a secret character named Rankles the Otter was hidden in Sonic and Knuckles. The magazine offered a staggering £1 million, about $1.3 million US at the time, to the first person who could send them a picture of the mysterious otter. Rankles, they claimed, was Knuckles' sidekick, a green otter with outsized sparkly ankles. Amusingly, the magazine admitted Rankles was a hoax in the exact same article, recommending anyone who sees him should call Alcoholics Anonymous because Tom Guys just made him up. Unfortunately, people never read to the end of the article, and speculation as to how to unlock Rankles needlessly swept the Sonic world for years to come. This wasn't the only Sonic hoax of the 90s. In 1999, a mysterious version of Sonic 1 was uploaded onto Simon Y's Sonic 2 beta page. It was titled Sonic 1 Beta? And blazed through the Sonic community with people believing the game to be a legitimate prototype of Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Mega Drive. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case. In actuality, a fan named Cyan Helcarax made the ROM, intentionally attempting to mimic the behavior of a genuine Sonic 1 prototype. His goal was to stir up more interest in Sonic 1 among the community, a goal that was handily achieved. In fact, for his efforts in making the hack, Helcorax was invited by Andy Wolan to be part of the Sonic Stuff Research Group. After the turn of the millennium, a Sonic community member named Blaze Hedgehog began a hoax surrounding the beta version of Sonic the Hedgehog 2. At the time, there were accounts of a genocide city zone planned for Sonic 2, but no information about the zone outside of sketchy sources and speculation. Blaze Hedgehog used those descriptions as a basis and combined elements from Vector Man 2, Sonic 2's Metropolis Zone, and Sonic 3's Launch Base Zone to create a fake E3 report on genocide city zone. The hoax was foiled when someone pointed out that E3 didn't actually start until after Sonic 2 had released. If the beta had been shown around this time, it would have been at the Consumer Electronics Expo. In one of the most notorious April Fool's jokes in gaming, Electronic Gaming Monthly claimed Sonic and Tails could be unlocked in Super Smash Bros. Melee by beating 20 enemies in the cruel melee mode. EGM also claimed that the player would get a special surprise upon beating Classic Mode with either Sonic or Tails. This is obviously false, and can be proven so simply by beating 20 enemies in Cruel Melee, though that's probably what EGM wanted. EGM eventually came clean and rewarded those who'd gotten more than 20 KOs in Cruel Melee with copies of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Sonic has since become playable in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, Smash for Wii U and 3DS, as well as Ultimate. But Tails only appears as a cameo in the background of Green Hill Zone and as a trophy. The next hoax again comes from Blaze Hedgehog, who made a hoax for the then non-existent Sonic Advance 2. Sonic Advance had just come out in Japan and the US, and Blaze knew a sequel was likely. Looking to do better than their last hoax, Blaze went to the effort of making a basic one-level game using Sonic Advance assets. They recorded gameplay of it, turned off the lights in their room, and took pictures of the video. Blaze then made a Burner Angel Fire account and added the images. The screenshots allegedly came from an insider source, which gave the Angel Fire domain an exclusive sneak peek at Sonic Advance 2. Blaze dropped the link in a few chat rooms and the site began to spread. While the images managed to fool a few people, Blaze was ultimately foiled again when someone realized that the sprite for Metal Sonic was ripped straight from a Game Gear title. When Sonic Advance 2 came out, Blaze felt they needed to do something for a fake Sonic Advance 3. This time it would be a spoof of Sonic and Knuckles, but for Sonic and Shadow. They tried to mimic the style of a Japanese magazine by running English text through Google Translate. Unfortunately, the laziness of this hoax was evident. Nobody fell for the prank. After Sonic Rush released in 2005, there was a period of time where fans were uncertain if a sequel would ever be made. Sega and the developer of the original Sonic Rush, Dimps, had supposedly had a falling out over one of Dimps' fighting games, The Rumblefish. During these few years of uncertainty, Blaze Hedgehog once again swept in with a fake screenshot, mocking up Sonic Rush 2. This time Blaze made everything in the hoax from scratch. Well, everything except for the Sonic model, which was actually from the PC version of Sonic Adventure. DX. Despite the extra effort, it doesn't seem the hoax convinced many either. On March 30th, 2006, a user named Sazpymon posted never-before-seen footage of Sonic Extreme to the website Sonic Cult. Sazpymon claimed that they traded a prototype of Gradius for this new prototype of Sonic Extreme. Within a few hours, a torrent file appeared on Pirate Bay. The rumor of a new Sonic Extreme build spread like wildfire. Several gaming websites reported on the rumor, as did the magazine Retro Gamer. 
Two days later, the seeded chunks of the torrent were finally compiled by other users, and it was eventually revealed to be all a hoax. The files were garbled nonsense, with the new footage having been provided by a Sonic Extreme programmer named Chris Sen, who was in on the April Fool's joke. While some found it funny, Assembler Games did not. They threatened to sue everyone involved in the prank. Our next hoax was for a fake sequel to Shadow the Hedgehog, aptly titled Shadow the Hedgehog 2 Redemption. For this hoax, which was once again by Blaze Hedgehog, Blaze tried the magazine approach, even detailing out planned features for the game. As a side effect of trying to do an E3 background behind the text, it looked like the magazine paper was thin enough to see the page on the other side, lending the hoax more credibility. Of course, it wasn't long before the prank was called out. Fans were quick to see that the street had come from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the shadow model from Sonic Heroes, and the soldier from the specialist's mod of Half-Life 1. During the preparation for a move to Japan, the founder of fan site Sonic Stadium reportedly received a phone call detailing an announced Nintendo DS game starring Knuckles the Echidna. The game was being made by Traveller's Tales, the team who made the games Sonic 3D Blast and Sonic R. Apparently, Sonic Team in Japan wasn't able to tackle the project as they wanted to concentrate their attention on their upcoming next gen Sonic title. This DS game appeared to be Sonic Rush, but starring Knuckles. The bottom screen featured different knuckle-based weapons called Punch Gears. The only confirmed Punch Gear was a metal claw used for digging, as seen in Sonic Adventure 2, which could destroy armoured enemies. Players could also get accessories, including the scuba gear from Sonic Adventure 2. Rather than a treasure hunt game focused on collecting Master Emerald Shards, it instead was a 2.5D platformer. But of course, this unannounced Nintendo DS game was never released. It was again an April Fool's joke. In 2009, an editor for the Sonic Stadium and Sonic Retro going by the name of Slingerland, posted new info about a secret in Sonic 2's beta. According to Slingerland, somebody named Sonic Loof sent in a screenshot of Super Tails, assumedly a more powerful version of Tails similar to Super Sonic. Super Tails could be unlocked by heading to the Hidden Palace Zone in debug mode, having Tails stand on the Master Emerald, then holding up while pressing A, B and C at the same time. Sonic Loof claimed that Super Tails, when revealed, is entirely in grayscale. Slingerland confirmed this with a screenshot and claimed video footage would be provided in due time, which was later revealed to be another April Fool's joke. In April 2011, Blaze Hedgehog had yet another crack at Sonic hoaxes. Their latest prank was for a game that fooled nobody. The idea was that Sega and Telltale Games would partner up for The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. Telltale would cash in on the trend of making new retro-styled games by making an adventure game about Sonic in the SCUMM point-and-click game engine. However, this was an April Fool's prank for the fan site TSSZ. On August 6th, 2012, a user named Oblivion the Hog claimed that they had found an old copy of a childhood magazine from Portugal that had exclusive pictures of a Sonic 3 beta. In these pictures, a red hedgehog was shown, thought to be an earlier version of Knuckles. The screenshots lined up with existing beta screenshots of Sonic 3 at the time. As there wasn't much information about Sonic 3's beta back then, there was no real way to disprove the screenshots, and many people believed it, only for Oblivion the Hog to lay to come clean and reveal that they had made the entire thing up, but not before posting several responses trying to make their piece of fake Sonic history seem as legitimate as possible. On April Fool's Day in 2015, SonicStadium.org claimed Sega were remastering the fabled 2006 game Sonic the Hedgehog. Supposedly, this remastered version would showcase improved gameplay, new features, and would have been made available on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One in time for the 25th anniversary of Sonic. Updated voice work, a 4K resolution, 60 FPS, FPS, included DLC, and new cutscenes to expand the story wrapped up this laughably fake announcement. In 2017, Sonic Stadium once again revealed Sega was planning something big. Literally. Big the Cat was apparently the last playable character in Sonic Mania. This was to be part of a cross-promotion with the officially sanctioned fan game Big's Big Fishing Adventure 3. The crossover was said to be a nod of respect to the Sonic fan community as Sega sought to best realise the fans' wishes. The fan game Big's Big Fishing Adventure 3 was intended to fill the gaps between Big the Cat's appearances in Sonic Adventure 2. Sega was supposedly adding Big the Cat to Sonic Mania after the surprising success of a prior April Fool's joke, which had then been focused on Big's Big Adventure 3. Big's gameplay would be similar to Sonic, Tails and Knuckles, only Big would have a larger sprite than the other three. Big also said to have a double jump using his umbrella, similar to what was seen in Sonic Heroes but just not being able to glide. All of this was, of course, revealed to be another April Fool's Day hoax. 
Even Sega themselves have gotten in on the hoaxes. In April 2019, Sega of America announced a new Sonic game via Twitter, saying, Move over, 100-man battle royales, the future is here. The game was Sonic Battle Royale, Sonic's foray into the battle royale genre. Extrapolating from the teaser poster, Sonic Battle Royale would be an MMO dating sim action survival FPS with PvP, and would be an ARPG on top of that. Hopefully, it was obvious that this was a joke, as the poster also claimed that Sonic Battle Royale would be free to play, VR compatible, have a 1000 player battle mode, over 4 million characters and chow cooking lessons. In February of this year, 2020, an anonymous user on 4chan's V-Board claimed Sega was preparing for a big Sonic reveal at the upcoming South by Southwest convention. This reveal was for a single game that would bring most of the mainline 3D Sonic games to current generation consoles. They even posted an image that initially featured new art. However, upon further inspection, the art reused existing material, including a fan-made font. The artist later came forward, confirming the hoax. Ever since the release of the original Sonic the Hedgehog game, there's been a slew of schoolyard rumors. One absurd yet persistent rumor is that it's possible to unlock a firearm in various Sonic games, starting with Sonic 1. These rumors usually say Sonic can unlock anything from a pistol to a rocket launcher by doing a specific set of actions or using cheat codes. These rumors may have even inspired the creation of the Shadow the Hedgehog game. According to the former head of Sonic Team, Yuji Naka, they received many letters from kids asking to give Sonic a gun, which led to them giving Shadow a gun in his own game. Another schoolyard rumor sprung up after Sonic 2's release. The rumor stated that when Sonic gets squished in Metropolis Zone, there's a small chance to see a pancaked Sonic fall off the screen followed by a pair of eyeballs. No proof of this exists, however, and there's no evidence of a squished Sonic or his loose eyeballs in the game's data. Although we've covered it in past videos, it's worth mentioning there were rumors of secret levels hidden within Sonic 2. These levels turned out to be the cut Hidden Palace Zone, which was shown off in magazines and special events before Sonic 2's release. Although 90s rumors aren't well documented, one was so persistent it's still brought up to this day. There's been conflicting rumors about Michael Jackson's involvement in the composition of Sonic 3's soundtrack for many years. In March 2006, YouTube user Qjimbo made a video titled Michael Jackson's Sonic 3, detailing evidence of Jackson's involvement. Their evidence included how Carnival Night Zone's theme had a similar breakdown to Jackson's song Jam, and how the Sonic 3 credits theme had a similar chord progression to Stranger in Moscow. Some tracks also had distinctive vocalizations reminiscent of Jackson's style. Many of Jackson's collaborators were also credited on Sonic 3, including Brad Buxer, Doug Grisby the Third, and Sirocco, aka C. Sirocco Jones. And there's already a connection between the two entities, as Sega had worked on Jackson's Moonwalker game. Fans speculated that Jackson was replaced and uncredited due to child abuse allegations surfacing during production of Sonic 3. The Sonic & Knuckles collection for PC fanned the flames of this rumor, as it used different music and didn't feature the Jackson-esque vocalizations. However, this may be due to the collection soundtrack being converted to a MIDI format for PC, which struggled to reproduce the same sounds as the Genesis. Some parts of the rumor were confirmed in a 2005 interview with Roger Hector, the ex-director of the Sega Technical Institute. Hector claimed the child abuse scandal emerged during work on Sonic 3, leading to Sonic spinball composer Howard Drossen rewriting much of Sonic 3's music. However, fans believe Jackson's songs are still in the game. Similarities emerged over the years, such as the Glass Smash sample and Carnival Night Zone also being in Jackson's In the Closet. In 2009, French magazine Black and White spoke to keyboardist Brad Buxer, a frequent Jackson collaborator who was credited in Sonic 3. He confirmed Jackson worked on Sonic 3, but as he'd never played it himself, Buxer couldn't confirm if the tracks made it into the game. However, he and other songwriters for Sonic 3 have contradicted Hector, stating Jackson withdrew his credit as he was unhappy with how his tracks sounded on the Genesis sound hardware. Buxer also confirmed Stranger in Moscow was based on the Sonic 3 end credits theme. In 2009, Sega released Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, where the first official acknowledgement of Jackson's involvement was made. Buxer's name surfaced again in 2013. He'd written a song called Hard Times with part of the group The Jetsons, which sounded almost identical to Ice Cap Zone Act 1. Buxer later confirmed he repurposed the song for Sonic. Game Trailers' Pop Fiction also looked into the mystery, finding both sides of the story somewhat true. Jackson indeed had issues with the sound quality, and backed away from the project while giving his blessing for his team to continue. At the same time, Sega wished to distance themselves from Jackson due to the controversy surrounding him. Hector told Game Trailers that Jackson loved Sonic 2, and asked to be shown around the Sega Technical Institute. While he was visiting, Jackson was asked by a developer if he'd like to work on the soundtrack for Sonic 3. 
Though Hector denied Jackson's work made it into the final game, a source involved with the game's development confirmed to game trailers that Jackson's work did make it in. They cited Carnival Night Zone specifically as a song that still contained Jackson's work. They also confirmed Jackson wanted Black and White to be in Sonic 3, but encountered resistance from his own lawyers. Sonic & Knuckles was also the subject of rumors. The Sonic & Knuckles cartridge featured lock-on technology, which let players plug other games on top of the cartridge. By plugging Sonic 3 on top, players can play through both games as one with new features, and by inserting Sonic 2, players can play as Knuckles through the entire game instead of Sonic. This feature led to rumors that Knuckles could be played in Sonic 1 if the cartridge was plugged into the top of Sonic & Knuckles. More outlandish rumors said plugging Echo the Dolphin or Streets of Rage 2 into the cart would unlock Sonic in those games as a playable character. According to TV Tropes, even the Australian magazine Sega Megazone claimed you could play as Tails in Sonic 1 using the lock-on tech. However, plugging these cartridges into Sonic and Knuckles easily debunks the rumors, as they simply trigger the incompatible No Way screen when booted up. That said, inserting Sonic 1 into Sonic and Knuckles does unlock something, a collection of Blue Sphere bonus stages. Some rumors spread saying you could unlock a playable character such as Hyper Tails, Metal Sonic, or Robotnik if you played through every Blue Sphere level after Sonic 1 is put into Sonic and Knuckles. However, this isn't the case. Due to the way the levels are generated, there's over 100 million stages to be played. But as TV Tropes points out, if each level is solved in just two minutes, it'd take around 400 years of continuous play to beat them all. There's also nothing in the game data suggesting there's unlockable or unused characters. There was also a rumor that you could beat the robot in Angel Island Act 1 before it torches the area. This would apparently leave the entire area lush and untorched. However, destroying the robot before it leaves isn't possible. The rumor probably stems from the fact that you can hit the robot in the same fashion as a boss. 1996's Sonic 3D Blast also attracted the rumor mill, with some alleging a secret level select menu was hidden in the game. Apparently, if players hit or jiggled the cartridge while the game was actually running, a message would appear saying, Congratulations, you found the secret level select screen. Then the select screen would start. This rumor turned out to be true, but the level select wasn't planned as an unlockable feature. The game's programmer, John Burton, explained the situation on his YouTube channel, Game Hut. To make sure 3D Blast made it past Sega's quality checks, which looked for things like bugs and crashes, Burton coded the game to redirect to a secret level select instead of an error screen in the event of a crash. This meant if the game did crash, testers at Sega would just think they'd unlocked a secret menu, and the game would be approved. It was never meant for the level select to be found by disrupting the cartridge. Hitting it just glitches the game. Before Sonic Adventure was unveiled, rumors circulated that a new Sonic & Knuckles game was in the works for the Dreamcast. However, no such game turned up, and when Sega showed off Sonic Adventure, it became clear the rumor was idle speculation. After the completion of Sonic Adventure in 1998, rumors popped up that Sonic Team would split into multiple smaller teams. This rumor was addressed by Yuji Naka, who said he couldn't answer whether the team would be broken into smaller units. In the end, Sonic Team did split in two. One half, led by Naka, remained in Japan to work on new franchises like Choo Choo Rocket, Samba de Amigo, and Fantasy Star Online. The other, named Sonic Team USA, moved to San Francisco to develop Sonic Adventure 2. In October 1999, shortly before Sonic Adventure 2 was announced, IGN reported Sonic 3 would be coming to the Dreamcast. A quote, very reliable source in Japan told them that Sonic 3 on Dreamcast will be an enhanced version, similar to Sonic Adventure, with a lot more. It's possible that someone saw footage of Sonic Adventure 2 and believed it to be a remake of Sonic 3, but even that would be a stretch. An often repeated rumor about Adventure 2 was that at some point in development it was meant to have branching storylines. An example was described in the UK's official Dreamcast Magazine issue number 7. Sonic would be trapped aboard a sinking submarine and the player would have a choice to either escape the sub or try to pilot it. This rumor was dispelled by game historian Liam Robertson after several outlets, us included, mistakenly reported the rumor as fact. Robertson had asked Akashi Izuka about it directly and was told it was never a feature. The existence of Shadow the Hedgehog and Rouge the Bat were rumored as early as April 2000. The rumors seemed to originate from IGN's defunct website Sega Dojo, after they spoke to an electronics boutique representative that had visited a game discussion at Sega HQ in San Francisco. The representative spoke of a female bat named Nails, who is said to be a spy. He also mentioned a dark version of Sonic, a shadow that only had one eye in some of the concept art. Official art confirming this claim was eventually shown in 2016. Shadow was formally unveiled in the first trailer for Sonic Adventure 2 at E3 2000. He remained a mystery for many months, but Shadow and Rouge's names were leaked by toy company Resaurus at the Toy Fair in February 2001. 
Resaurus was advertising its third series of Sonic Adventure figures, which was set to include Shadow and Rouge. Resaurus went out of business before they were able to release these figures. There were other, less credible rumors. Some rumors stated that Tails wouldn't be in Adventure 2, and that Metal Sonic would be the villain. Some rumors also said Sonic would be kidnapped, and that Tails, Knuckles, and Amy would rescue him. Official Dreamcast Magazine claimed that five new characters from Genesis, Game Gear, and Arcade Sonic titles would be added to the game. This meant characters like Mighty, SBO, Vector, and others might appear in the game. However, the final game had very few returning characters outside of the core cast. After Adventure 2's release, rumors spread about various Chow forms. Since Chow could be bred and trained to achieve new forms and colors, many rumored forms spread online. One rumor spoke of a chameleon Chow that changed color as the player moved the camera, and another told of a big Chow that was twice the size of a normal Chow. It was also rumored Omo Chow could be unlocked as a Chow. There were even rumors of secret unlockable items like the Chow Cookie, which boosts a Chow's stats. A more gruesome rumor said Chow could be stillborn. However, none of these rumored forms were actually in the game. In late 2000, rumors popped up of a 10th anniversary Sonic game. This was believed to be a Sonic compilation featuring all of Sonic's Genesis, 32X, Sega CD, and Saturn games on two GD ROMs. However, no compilation ever surfaced. In 2000 and 2001, a few rumors emerged that Sega and Nintendo were working on a crossover RPG for both the Dreamcast and GameCube featuring Mario and Sonic. The crossover RPG was said to have characters like Sonic, Knights, Virtual Fighter Kids, Mario, Donkey Kong, and Pikachu. The Dreamcast version would apparently have been titled Sega and Nintendo, the Cosmo Cube, with the GameCube version being titled Nintendo and Sega, the dream come true. The rumors became so rampant that then-president of Sega of America, Peter Moore, commented on the rumors. Moore told IGN he thought the rumors were just wishful thinking, but he wouldn't be surprised if Sega and Nintendo worked together in some way on future games. Moore's comments seemed to put an end to most speculation. One of the Sonic series' most persistent rumors is the existence of a Sonic Adventure 3. One of the earliest rumors of a Sonic Adventure 3 was posted in May 2002 by several outlets, claiming the game had entered development. The rumor also alleged the game would release on GameCube and Xbox, and that it had Sonic, Shadow, Tails, and Knuckles as playable characters. The game would also have the best camera system ever seen in any platform ever. This, unfortunately, wasn't the case. Takashi Izuka believes the series has advanced beyond the adventure titles, and confirmed the only way a third game would happen is if the gameplay play evolved to a point where they'd feel justified naming it Adventure 3. However, some fans believe 2006's Sonic the Hedgehog is the missing Sonic Adventure 3, as the game shares many similarities with the adventure titles. Sonic Unleashed was also titled Sonic World Adventure in Japan, which could be seen as the third entry. In May 2002, the Sonic fan site SonicHQ.net reported on two rumored games. These were a game titled Sonic and Shadow for the Game Boy Advance, and Chow Racing, which was also for a GBA release. While Chow Racing was self-explanatory, Sonic and Shadow was presumably a platformer. However, the site provided no info on either game besides their names, and the titles never came about. A few rumors also spread after the release of Sonic Heroes. It was rumored that you could unlock Metal Sonic in the game by getting an A rank in every stage, just like in Adventure DX. Another rumor said that getting an A rank on everything would unlock Team Metal, who would chase Team Sonic throughout their stages. A rumor about the voice cast of the Sonic games popped up after the release of Sonic Advance 3. This was the final game in the series with the original Sonic Adventure voice cast. From Shadow the Hedgehog onwards, they were replaced by the cast from Sonic X. The game also marked the last time Eggman's voice actor, Dean Bristow, would record new lines for the character before his passing. Some Sonic fans speculated that Bristow's passing is what made Sega replace the existing voice lineup with the Sonic X cast, but this wasn't true. In 2008, Sonic fan site SonicScene.net interviewed Eggman's current voice actor, Mike Pollock. Pollock revealed that the choice to replace the adventure cast with Sonic X's was made before Bristow's passing. Pollock said it was a business decision, which also lines up with statements from Simon Jeffrey, who was president of Sega of America until 2009. Jeffrey told SonicStadium.org, Sega of America are a subsidiary of Sega of Japan. They reside in Japan and do not come under my jurisdiction at all. Likewise, Sega of America has no say in the voice casting. There was another small rumor surrounding the Japanese version of Shadow the Hedgehog. Apparently, Maria's death scene was more graphic and featured red blood. However, in reality, the scene obscures any graphic imagery, just like in the West. Rumors also popped up around 2006's Sonic the Hedgehog. There was a rainbow gem in the game's demo that could be found at the store but couldn't be bought. 
This led to fans assuming it'd be in the final game, but when the game released, the gem was nowhere to be found. This led to rumors the gem was hidden and had to be unlocked through some feat. This ranged from beating all the game's hard mode stages, finishing every stage quickly, or finishing every stage with a perfect score. Fans were fueled by the idea that the gem would unlock the ability to turn into Super Sonic. However, the rainbow gem was cut from the final game, despite it originally being planned to unlock Super Sonic in some way. Before Sonic Riders release in 2006, Nintendo Power revealed that I.I. would be a playable character in the game. However, the magazine also started a rumor that Mario would be playable in the GameCube version of Riders. This was ultimately proven false. But they weren't the only Nintendo magazine to post falsehoods about Sonic. In February 2010, Endgamer magazine claimed Sonic would be playable in Super Mario Galaxy 2, with Sonic levels appearing in Green Hill Galaxy. The magazine cited an anonymous insider for these claims, who was clearly misinformed or lying. In June 2011, details emerged from a supposed rep of Sega Mexico. In a chat room, the rep posted details about some Sonic games. They stated the Sonic Storybook series was part of a trilogy, implying a third game similar to Secret Rings and Black Knight was in the works. The rep also teased a game in the Sega Superstar series, and when asked about Tails getting his own game, they said something like a Sonic Adventure 3 DS? I think that would be a great idea. Clearly, none of this was true. Other rumors around this time stated that Sonic Generations would be coming to PS Vita and Nintendo's Wii U. However, these versions never surfaced. Also in 2011, rumors of a new Sonic game titled Sonic Dimensions began circulating. The game supposedly had Sonic split into multicolored copies of himself after an incident with one of Dr. Eggman's machines. The colors were red, orange, purple, green, and yellow, in addition to the original blue. Each would have different attributes, such as the red Sonic being able to create explosions but having low speed and jump height, and Purple Sonic having psychic powers similar to Silver. The game was also set to have 2D gameplay with mechanics very similar to those of classic Sonic titles. Sega was said to be collaborating with Nintendo on the game, leading to speculation it would be a Wii U exclusive. There is no evidence a game like this ever existed. In July 2012, rumors surfaced that Sonic Adventure 3 was in production again. Further speculation arose when several web domains were discovered, including SonicAdventure3.com, .net, .org, .info, .fr, and .eu. Although these domains seem like evidence for the game's existence, Sega may have bought them just to have them, which isn't uncommon for game companies. In January 2013, rumors emerged that Sega would soon reveal a new Sonic game named Sonic Excursion. Rumors circulated on 4chan describing a game that switched between full 3D and 2.5D side-scrolling sections. Levels had multiple routes and exits, and each character could access parts of the stage others couldn't. Players started the game as Sonic, but unlocked more characters as they went, unlocking around 10 characters by the end. The game was leaked by Wentos, a leaker who accurately predicted numerous games before, including Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Generations. Wentos claimed Excursion played similarly to Generations, and that the first level was named Shattered Heights. The game would apparently be released for all platforms, including a console called Xbox Infinite. The game's 3DS version would be a Sonic Rush-styled game that was similar in concept but smaller in scope. However, there's no evidence the game ever existed. Later in 2013, a game called Sonic Thunderstorm or Sonic Blue Thunder was rumored to exist. This game had a new character named Static the Hedgehog, and most of the recurring Sonic cast would have teenage clones of themselves. This game would be similar to Sonic Colors, but have four different story modes and see the return of Chow Gardens. As you might expect, the game never surfaced. In May 2015, rumors of a new Sonic title surfaced once again. This was due to Orbot's German voice actor Romanus Furman updating his resume to include a game called Sonic Mach 2. No other info was given about the game besides a 2015 release. To get more info, fans messaged Sonic developer Takashi Izuka on Facebook. Izuka's messages were somewhat vague and seemed to deflect more than confirm or deny anything. After a few Sonic fan sites reported on the rumor, Furman removed the game from his resume. As Sonic Runners released in 2015 and had Orbots in it, it's possible that Sonic Mach 2 was an early name for Runners. But without confirmation, it could all be a mistake that led to rumors. In early 2018, rumors of a Sonic Heroes remake circulated on 4chan. The rumor said that Sonic Team was working on a Sonic Heroes remake for some time, with it being developed alongside Sonic Forces. It would be a timed exclusive on the PS4, with Xbox, Switch, and PC versions following four months later. The game was said to have a graphical overhaul resembling a more refined version of Seaside Hill from Sonic Generations. The game would also include an online time trial leaderboard, and a new team where players can insert Sonic Forces avatars. 
players could even import their Forces avatars into Heroes. A leak around the same time said Forces 2 was in the works. None of these games surfaced, however. In late 2019, someone alleging to be a Sega of America employee took to 4chan, talking about a game called Sonic Rift. This was supposedly Sonic's 30th anniversary game, and was the first in a two-part volume, with the second game releasing on Sonic's 35th anniversary. The 35th anniversary game would be Sonic Adventure 3, and bring back every villain and act as both a finale and a setup for a new continuity. Other games would release between two titles, such as Sonic Mania 2 and possibly Sonic 5. Dimps had apparently been contacted about making a new Sonic Rush title that'd be exclusive for Switch called Sonic Rush Infinity. If you're thinking this sounds laughably hopeful, you're right. None of these games surfaced. Fans had always hoped that the Sonic Adventure games would receive a sequel or be remade, and in early 2020, speculation turned into full-blown rumors. The rumors stated that Sega was preparing a Sonic Adventure-themed music event, which would take place sometime later that year. Sonic fan site TSSZ was tipped off that singer-songwriter Eizo Sakamoto would be singing Open Your Heart at the event, and they were even sent two MP3s of Sakamoto singing for the song. This is noteworthy, as Sakamoto performed Open Your Heart when Sonic Adventure was first revealed. The rumored event was also set to feature new artwork of Sonic in a pose from Sonic Adventure DX with updated graphics. In April the previous year, former Sonic Team artist Hiroshi Nishiyama also had been rehired. Again, this is noteworthy, as Nishiyama worked on Adventure as lead field artist. Not only this, but in late 2018, Takashi Izuka himself told Retro Gamer he'd like to remake the game, saying, It was the very first 3D game that we worked on, and looking at it now, I can see the rough edges it has, which really makes me want to remake it again. The music featuring Sakamoto, Nishiyama being rehired, and Izuka's comments have all led fans to believe a Sonic Adventure game may be announced in 2020. But if we've learned anything throughout the course of this video, it's to not get our hopes up. Intended to tide over audiences awaiting a true original 3D Sonic adventure on the Sega Saturn, Sonic R ultimately ended up as one of the closest things fans would ever come to want. Desperate to fill a gap in their 1997 holiday lineup, Sega handed their mascot over to Traveler's Tales. The result was an unconventional on-foot racer with an upbeat Europop soundtrack. But how did such a departure from the traditional installments of Sega's biggest platforming series come to be? Chasing up former staff and scanning through the wealth of information carefully archived by sites like Sonic Retro, I've been piecing together the story behind Sonic R. Join me as I go back in time to another world when Sega was still trying to change the Saturn's fortunes. The original concept of a Sonic racing game is known to have come from Yuji Naka, one of the major creative forces behind Sonic who served as lead programmer on each of the early main series titles. Naka had always been interested in doing an on-foot racing game with Sonic characters. The competitive mode in Sonic 2, which offered split-screen racing for two players, was one early exploration of this idea. After that, he still intended to one day make a separate spin-off game around it, and when the Saturn's lineup was in need of support, the ideal opportunity for it presented itself. Naka's original intention was to have Sonic Team themselves develop it. However, they had since become otherwise engaged, creating a Saturn collection of Sonic's Mega Drive outings called Sonic Jam. Sega instead turned to a small developer in Nutsford, England. Traveller's Tales had first caught Sega's attention with their Mega Drive version of the Toy Story tie-in video game. Impressed with this effort, Yuji Naka had personally recommended them for a potential collaboration. The result was Sonic 3D Blast for the Mega Drive and Saturn, a platformer that offered a different take on the hedgehog with an isometric camera perspective. Sega was sufficiently pleased with their work on this title that they were already considering them for another future Sonic project before the end of its development. When Sega eventually chose Traveler's Tales for their Sonic racing game, however, they were already underway on another project for them. I spoke to John Burton, Sonic R's lead programmer and the founder of Traveler's Tales who recounted what happened. The developers at TT had been creating their own engine, designed specifically to be used for racing games on the Saturn. They had struck a deal to develop a Formula One game exclusively for the Saturn, which was set to be published by Sega themselves. 
This was intended to compete with the 1996 PS1 Formula 1 game by Bizarre Creations, which had been a booming financial success. The TT Formula 1 project was a few months into pre-production when in early 1997, Sega decided to apply the brakes on it. The long-awaited Sonic Extreme, once supposed to be Sega's flagship 3D Sonic platformer for the Saturn, had been cancelled. It left Sega scrambling to fill a Blue Hedgehog shaped hole in their holiday lineup. Taking Yuji Naka's suggestion, they signed a new contract with Traveller's Tales, permitting them to retrofit their Formula One project into a Sonic Racer. Development began in around February 1997, during which time it was known as Sonic TT. References to this title can be found in the game's source code. John Burton told me that this was a nod not only to Traveller's Tales, but to racing terms like Time Trial and Taurus Trophy. Sega initially signalled that they liked the idea, but later chose to change it after a couple of months to Sonic R. According to an interview conducted in early 1997 with a Sega spokesperson, quote, the R stands for many different things and not just racing. It is up to the player to decide exactly what. Due to Sega being based in Japan, the game was subject to a transcontinental development. Characters and levels were sketched out by Japanese staff and sent over to Traveller's Tales in England for them to model and program. In the case of the racetracks, they were quite literally sketched out on paper. Sega's artists sent Traveller's Tales actual paper drawings of the map layouts for them to adapt. Sega's primary liaison with Traveller's Tales was a producer named Kat Sato, who spent development on site in England. Since internet infrastructure in the UK was in its infancy, Sato spent a significant amount of time in expensive long-distance phone calls to Japan, discussing the game's design in order to accurately relay their instructions. According to Sato, he formed a good relationship with the team at Traveller's Tales and became close personal friends with John Burton, to the point at which he attended his wedding during the development of Sonic R. Yuji Naka also paid the studio a visit, John Burton told me. Yuji Naka did visit the studio in person. In fact, we had dinner with him at a local Italian restaurant. I remember the restaurant had paper tablecloths at the time, and it was for people to doodle on during dinner. Yuji drew a Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon on the tablecloth, and I remember afterwards wishing I'd taken it with us instead of leaving it there. I also met him again in Japan. We had a meeting and dinner, I think. I remember he parked his Sonic Blue Porsche 911 in one of those vending machine car parks they have in Japan. I'd never seen parking like that before. By March 14th, 1997, the developers had put together an early first prototype for the game, which John Burton later labelled 0.1. Retrofitting some of the work done on their Formula 1 game, this essentially acted as a first run at demonstrating the technology that would power Sonic R. The user could guide the camera on a fixed track through a metallic blue race course, complete with Sonic and Robotnik easter eggs in the background, and in true Sonic fashion, a loop-de-loop. -loop. The environment seen in 0.1 was made for internal purposes, and never appeared in later builds. Three weeks later, however, the team was starting to realise the first level that would make it into the release game. Shared by John Burton in 2017 on YouTube, version 0.2 features a very early resort island. Like the previous prototype, it can only be controlled by manoeuvring down a predetermined line, but it offers us a glimpse into what was and what had yet to be at this early phase. Multiple Sonic models glide down the track, an early test of multiple characters before other character models had been built in. The level featured a clearly very different skybox. This was actually a placeholder used for test purposes, which originated from another Traveller's Tales game, 1994's Mickey Mania. It was taken from the background of the Moose Hunters level, based on the classic Disney short of the same name. Another noteworthy fixture of this build is a metallic Sonic model floating throughout the course. This was implemented to test reflection mapping on characters during gameplay, but the Saturn, with its limited capabilities, was unable to support it, according to John Burton. The effect was instead reserved for other parts of the game, such as the rotating R on the title screen and the reflective Sonic head seen during loading. 
Sonic R's art, by all accounts, evolved considerably over the course of its creation, and was initially intended to feature a style much closer to Sonic 3D Blast. Resort Island, for example, once included foliage textures that were identical to those seen in 3D Blast, but this direction was later abandoned. The following prototype, 0.3 from May 2nd in 1997, marks the first demo to be shown to Sega. By this point, the player had more direct control over Sonic. We can start to see the beginning of the game's innovative fading technology to mask its draw distance, and the rings now had collision programmed, meaning they could be collected. The ring gates, on the other hand, which players can unlock by collecting a certain amount of rings, had yet to be put in place. Sonic could instead freely walk through the cave, where one would later be added. This build shows us another unused skybox as well, one including a sun setting over a mountain range. As it turns out, this background was intended to be used in the game until fairly late on. Sonic R was previewed by a myriad of different publications in the run-up to launch, and this evening variant of Resort Island was included in many of them. It appears to have been present in the game until some time in summer of 1997. John Burton has explained the very simple rationale behind its removal. Upon listening to Can You Feel the Sunshine, the track's musical theme, it dawned upon John how out of place the background felt in consideration of its lyrics. It was therefore altered to be set during the middle of the day, so players could truly feel the aforementioned sunshine. The game made its official public debut at E3 in June 1997. A trailer circulated at the time claimed it was 20% completed. Builds with an early version of Resort Island were playable on the show floor to attendees, and the developers took this opportunity to closely observe the reactions of players. One valuable piece of feedback gathered from this experience relates to the water which flows throughout the level. John Burton said that in these prototypes, falling into the lake would slow the player down significantly, making it hard for them to recover in the competition. People sampling the demo would often abandon their play sessions entirely when this happened, quickly losing interest and walking away from the kiosks. When the team returned from E3 that year, John therefore made it a priority to speed up movement when underwater, making it less daunting and easier for players to regain their footing in the race. As others tell it, however, Sonic R garnered some very negative reactions at E3, causing considerable concern at Sega. Hirokazu Yasuhara, who is best known for being the lead designer on the original 2D Sonic games, spoke candidly about this in a 2003 interview with Game Informer. He revealed that he was drafted in mid-development to revamp its level design. Sega asked me to work with Traveler's Tales. Sonic R had received awful reviews at E3, and Sega wanted me to improve it. I was asked to help out even though I was not working on Sonic games anymore. Sonic R was promoted by Sega as part of a multi-game marketing strategy called Project Sonic. The goal of this label was to advertise Sonic's Saturn titles and to boost the franchise's profile in Japan. Phase 1 of Project Sonic was Sonic Jam, while Sonic R became Phase 2. By all accounts, it was shown to journalists not only at E3, but behind closed doors numerous times in the months after. It's in these previews that we can see more cuts and changes made on the road to release. The character icons seen on the left of the HUD featured different art, similar in appearance to the item boxes from 2D Sonic games. They were later redone and given new black backgrounds. The ring gates in Resort Island originally required a far higher amount of rings to pass through. One, for instance, needed as many as 100 rings, whereas the same gate in the finished game asks for half that amount. The mini-map seen in the bottom right of the screen in the finished game is noticeably missing from these prototypes, although one was always intended to be added later. It simply had yet to be implemented. Sonic R was prominently featured in the UK's Sega Saturn magazine, and it was in the August 1997 issue that they showed off a power-up which was ultimately destined for the cutting room floor. The game was originally intended to include the three element shields introduced in Sonic the Hedgehog 3, the bubble shield, the lightning shield, and the flame shield, and it was the last of those which was subject to removal. Like its appearance in Sonic 3, the flame shield essentially functioned as a buffer against attacks and would be extinguished if the player fell underwater. 
The item was removed from the game a few months out from release, as the developers deemed it too similar to the Lightning Shield, which too protected against attacks and disappeared after coming into contact with water, but also had the benefit of attracting nearby rings. The Flame Shields that were built into the game appear to have been replaced by Lightning Shields, if a leaked prototype from September 97 is any indication, as the Lightning Shields in this version share the same colour graphic as the Flame Shields, but do attract rings. One noticeable difference between earlier prototypes and later builds is the appearance of Dr. Robotnik's Eggmobile ship. Its undercarriage once sported a large black and red missile with a mischievous grinning face. It was eventually altered to a grey cannon due to impracticalities presented by the original design. The developers would have had to animate the missile detaching from the underside of Robotnik's vehicle and a new one appearing in its place, something John Burton said their engine was not set up to support on the Sega Saturn. That's why in prototypes with the older design, Robotnik's missile cannot actually fire. The final design, which was much simpler, also had the benefit of trimming the model's polygon count. Another significant change to weaponry in the game concerns Amy's car. Originally, it was going to be able to produce a large spinning saw blade to attack racers in front of her. This was seen as a way to put her on par with Robotnik, who was planned to have an offensive manoeuvre of his own, but it was ultimately vetoed for being too violent. Across the board, the initial prototype models for Sonic R were more detailed than those in the finished product. Many of them received numerous minor adjustments, usually to keep them in line with polygon quarters for the sake of performance. Tails once had 3D whiskers and strands of hair that stuck out. Amy's car included a spoiler on the rear. Knuckles had more defined dreadlocks using more polygons which hung down his back more, and an alternate colour scheme for his shoes featuring orange, which was closer to his appearance in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. These older renders were used in select promotional material in the run-up to release, and even appeared in the game's instruction manual. Metal Sonic, on the other hand, once had a more detailed jet engine on his back, and the Egg Robo 2 sported a jet pack that was originally split into two separate parts, but was later merged into one. Throughout 1997, Sonic R appeared on multiple occasions in Sega Video Magazine, a series of promotional VHS tapes sent out to advertise new and upcoming Sega products in Japan. The footage used in these tapes includes unfinished versions of Tails and Knuckles, distinguishable by the blue aura around them when jumping. This indicates that they must have been newly added to the game, as the developers had yet to alter the aura from Sonic's blue to their respective orange and red colours. These clips are also notable for featuring an alternate version of the game's main musical theme, Super Sonic Racing. While the final song was performed by TJ Davis, this iteration, which had different instrumentation, was sung by another artist. This version of the song also appeared at E397 and could be heard during gameplay on the Resort Island stage. To learn more about this mysterious track, I spoke to the composer of Sonic R's soundtrack, Richard Jacks, who explained its origins in full. Quotes, this was a work-in-progress version of Supersonic Racing. The singer is a lady who used to work in the Sega Europe offices, and I used her to create a demo of the song for Yuji Naka to listen to and approve. This is often what takes place before spending financial resources on studio time with session singers slash musicians. Richard added that he did not have a copy of it himself. In the beginning, it was not Yuji Naka's intention for each level's music to include vocals. According to Richard Jacks and TJ Davis, they were initially only contracted to produce Supersonic Racing as a title theme, but the song was received so warmly by Naka that he decided the rest of the soundtrack should follow suit. John Burton has said that he was concerned about how audiences would respond to this direction at first, and therefore decided to build in an option to turn the vocals off. He even planned at one point that they would be disabled by default, and instrumental versions would play instead. Over time, however, he grew to like the vocal tracks, so much so that he decided they would be turned on by default in the final game. As 1997 went on, Traveller's Tales continued interacting with the press, providing up-to-date information as the project raced towards the finish line. Tips and Tricks magazine was one such outlet to cover the game, and in September 97, they reported on two different gameplay modes that ultimately didn't make it into the release game. Quotes, a variety of gameplay modes are available, ring attack, relay race, and even tag. 
The only one of those to actually be realised in the end was Tag, wherein the player must bump into different computer controlled races to win. Whereas the elusive ring attack was never again mentioned in future previews, Relay Race continued to be teased. In the October 97 edition of Sega Saturn Magazine, John Burton mentions some of the planned game types, and his choice of words reveals how unsure he was of Relay Race's inclusion at the time. Quote, there will be a two-player mode, including race and battle modes hopefully, as well as time trial, tag, and possibly relay modes. This was one of the last times the relay mode was mentioned, and for many years, over two decades in fact, what this would have entailed remained uncertain. That was until June 2018 when John Burton revealed via YouTube that it would have seen the player choosing a few different characters and taking turns controlling each throughout the race. As the player finished one lap, they would pass over to the next character and so on until the race concluded. John wasn't completely sure of why it was dropped, but speculated the game's tech simply wasn't set up to do character swapping of this nature. Time constraints may have also played a role, given how the developers had a strict deadline for Sonic R to be on sale in time for the 1997 holiday period. This may also explain the absence of another mode teased in magazines at the time called Mirror Mode. Like the mode of the same name from the Mario Kart series, this would have reflected each track, challenging the player's knowledge of each course with this added twist. A mirror mode appearing in Sonic R was mentioned in a couple of different previews, including the aforementioned Sega Saturn Magazine write-up from October 97. John Burton believes that it was never finished primarily because its implementation would have slowed down the game's polygon draw code. Its removal is just another reminder of the delicate balance Traveller's Tales had to strike as they attempted to work within the Saturn's hardware limitations. In the final months before launch, a mock-up of the game's cover was sent out to media outlets and toy cat logs featuring different art from that which later showed up on store shelves. A version of this art also functioned as the title screen in prototypes. The original render, seen here, was drawn in a 2D style more in line with other Sonic covers from this era, but was eventually redesigned. What replaced it was a completely different take on the material with 3D visuals. John Burton has said that he much prefers the original rendition, and that Sega had it redone to avoid spoiling the presence of Metal Sonic, a secret unlockable character who could be seen on the older cover. The original box art does briefly appear in the final game, however, at the end of the credits, with the phrase See ya placed over it. The high-resolution 3D models of characters and levels took multiple days to render, according to Burton. The silicon graphics computers which produced them cost $30,000 each, using software packages worth $20,000 back in 1997. Some minor differences can be observed between the final courses and these renders, such as in the case of Regal Ruin. In the finished version, pillars were later added into the pool of water to the right of the start line, for example. Through examining earlier builds and previews, we can see that each level in the game had a single word working title during development. Resort Island was Island, Radical City was City, Regal Ruin was Ruin, and according to the November 97 edition of Saturn Power Magazine, Reactive Factory was originally referred to as Industrial, before being changed to Factory. Each was later given a title starting with the letter R to match the game's namesake. We can mine further changes from a prototype shared by Hidden Palace dated September 1997, which contains three different levels, Island, City, and Factory, the last of which is still very unfinished. The differences between it and the release build are manifold. The prototype has different menus which are static and include the older high-poly renders of the characters. Different loading screens featuring a disc with a reflection of the original title screen art. The race countdown timer sound is different, and its text reads 3, 2, 1, go, which was later changed to ready, set, go, with a line voiced by TJ Davis. The countdown text is partially transparent in the prototype and a darker shade of blue. Sonic uses his idle animation on the start line, whereas in the final game he stands still. All the AI characters receive a speed boost at the start of each race in the prototype, meaning the player always starts in last place and must catch them up. Each course was intended at this point to contain 9 separate coins to collect, as opposed to the 5 in the finish game. Some are hidden in places where coins aren't present in the final version. In Resort Island, for instance, one is next to the huts, another can be found among the pine trees. 
The ring gates, which grant access to alternate routes, required a high amount of rings in the prototype. The Chaos Emeralds were originally a different, taller shape, with a point at the top. Sonic's idle animation was different. The icons on the left of the screen, as well as sporting different designs, work slightly differently. In this version, the character in first place has a larger icon, while in the final build, the player's icon is always bigger than the others to highlight your position more effectively. If Sonic finishes a race in either 4th or 5th place, he will sometimes burst into tears in the prototype, but this was later removed. Radical City's start line is further forward, closer to the archway, and the characters begin much closer to each other. Likewise, the start position for Reactive Factory was further down the course, closer to these two slopes. The level also has a metal floor surrounding it in the distance, which was replaced with water in the final version. The first alternate route you encounter in this course has a slightly different design here. The entrance to the Spring Room was situated at the front of the metal spire, whereas in the release build, it's found around the back of it and takes slightly longer to access. It's also surrounded by water in the prototype that the player can fall into, whereas this water is blocked off by fencing in the final. When AI characters complete the race before you in the prototype, they will wait for you on the finish line. In the final build, they will instead continue doing laps at the track until the race is over. Then there are elements of the prototype that are simply unfinished. The minimap, for instance, doesn't yet track the positions of characters throughout the stages. The arrows instructing players where to go haven't yet been implemented. Robotnik's hands are missing from his victory pose. The replay feature is broken and often sends your character bumping into walls and falling into water. Some of the alternate routes in the factory level are incomplete. Doors where coins are hidden in the final game cannot be opened, and the path to the Chaos Emerald aboard the submarine is partly obscured. On the other hand, it's notable how much of the game was nailed down by this point. Even small elements like easter eggs are in place, such as one planted there by John Burton personally. He included an ichthys, a symbol which is said to have been employed by Christians to discreetly identify other members of the church amid the persecution of the Roman Empire. The symbol was often placed on doors of homes and churches. In Sonic R, it can be found on one of the huts in Resort Island, a nod to Burton's religious beliefs. According to John, Sega was fully aware of the symbol's presence in the game and did not object to it. Despite having around only 9 months, Traveller's Tales was able to meet their tight deadline and finish the game in time for the 1997 holidays. Hirokazu Yasuhara, who was initially unsure of the project's potential when he joined the team, later expressed a degree of appreciation for it. Quote, I think that, although I only joined the project in the middle, the final version of Sonic R is actually quite good. I understand that it is difficult to reverse negative impressions on the game after it receives bad reviews at E3. People do not play or buy it, so they cannot change their opinions. However, I do admit that the base concept concept of Sonic R, in which the player drives running characters, is not great. Sonic R was first released in November 1997, but that might not have been the case were it not for the actions of one person in particular. Kat Sato, who was overseeing the project on Sega's behalf at Traveller's Tales, revealed in an interview with French blog Terre de Jure that he got into a heated disagreement with Yuji Naka over the game's content. Naka had requested more additions to the game, but with the schedule already tight, Sato told him that it could not be done leading to an intense argument. So impassioned was this dispute that Sato, who had previously been a prominent public figurehead for the game, no longer even wanted his name associated with it. He chose to have his name excluded from the in-game credits. I asked John Burton to give his side of what happened. Quote, I know Katz had his credit removed from the game, which is a real shame, as he was a great supporter of the studio. I have no idea if he lost his credit because he was protecting us from some of the changes, or if he was perhaps standing up for some of the design decisions we made. Either way, I'm pretty sure it was for supporting us. This was eventually corrected when Sonic R was ported to PC one year later. In that release, Sato was credited as the project director, and in the years since has publicly discussed his work on it. Still, it's worth remarking on the fact that if you play the original version of Sonic R, the project director, one of the people most responsible for shaping it into what it is today, is not credited for it at all. 
Sonic R received mixed to positive reviews upon launch. Critics praised its level design and visuals, while opinion was divided over its soundtrack and short length. Despite this division, the game has remained beloved by a passionate sect of the Sonic fanbase. 20 years on from release, John Burton began sharing fresh insights from its development, showcasing prototypes and material he had been able to preserve. His YouTube channel Game Hut has offered fans a rare look behind the curtain of Traveller's Tales and into the creation of some of its past titles. Did you know? In October 2016, Tim Miller revealed he'd be working on a Sonic the Hedgehog movie with Sony. The announcement came sooner than two weeks after Miller left Deadpool 2, where he cited creative differences with star Ryan Reynolds as his reason for leaving the project. Miller was joined by Jeff Fowler, making his directorial debut. Miller and Fowler are longtime collaborators, having worked together at the visual effects, animation, and design company Blur Studio. Interestingly, this wasn't the first time the pair had worked with the Sonic franchise. Blur Studio had previously made the CG cutscenes for Shadow the Hedgehog and 2006's Sonic the Hedgehog. Sony acquired the Sonic license sometime in 2013 and attached 21 Jump Street producer Neil Moritz to the film the following year. The movie was planned to be a live-action CG hybrid. However, nothing came of the project, and in 2017, Paramount acquired the rights from Sony. Miller and Fowler migrated with the change in studio. Paul Rudd was a potential choice to play Sonic's friend Tom Wachowski, but the role ultimately went to James Marsden. Further casting announcements were Ben Schwartz, who would voice Sonic, and Jim Carrey, who would play Dr. Ivo Robotnik. Carrey took the role because of how fun it seemed, commenting that one of his favorite types of role to play was intelligence screwed up by ego. Carrey wanted to tap into the same absurd energy he brought to his other iconic roles like Ace Ventura and The Grinch. Filming for Sonic took place across 2018. In November, filming was spotted in parts of San Francisco. Some thought this may have been a throwback to Sonic Adventure 2, which features a city heavily resembling San Fran. The movie was teased online with an animated poster on December 10, 2018. The poster showed a silhouetted Sonic, teasing his new design. Reactions were mixed, with many noting the musculature of his arms and legs, which spawned many memes. The more realistic take on the character was a deliberate choice. The production team took inspiration from the movie Ted when incorporating a CG character into a realistic setting. Giving Sonic realistic fur was the first alteration made to his character design, according to Miller, as it made him feel like a real creature. The most difficult part of making his design more realistic was the eyes. Sonic is usually depicted stylistically with a single eye with two pupils, which the filmmakers felt wouldn't work in a realistic setting. Sega resisted the decision to separate his eyes, but Miller was firm that a single eye would look strange. Miller was also concerned about the limits of Sonic's speed and strove to keep his powers grounded. Despite this, Sonic is apparently capable of moving so fast that it appears time has stopped in the first trailer. On December 13th, more posters were leaked, one revealing Sonic's final design and the other showing him sitting atop the Golden Gate Bridge. This latter poster was soon confirmed to be real. This post again spawned many memes. People either photoshopped the background so Sonic was sitting in different situations or tried to replicate the pose, with some believing Sonic's legs must have been dislocated to maintain the pose. In response, the Sonic Movie Twitter page posted an image of a comically muscular Sonic holding a sign saying, Can't a guy work out? This tweet has since been deleted. On the 4th of March, the art and branding agency Hanagami Carol Inc. uploaded a new page to their portfolio showing Sonic's final design in the movie. While HCI weren't responsible for the design in the first place, and while there was some doubt due to the leaked nature of the reveal, many assumed the design was indeed accurate. The design was poorly received. Among the detractors were Sonic's original creators, including character designer Naoto Oshima. Sonic is a fairy of a hedgehog, so he doesn't need to be designed closer to a real hedgehog even in live action. Mickey doesn't become a mouse in live action, does he? Because they're fairies who can live on when people believe in them. Yuji Naka, former head of Sonic Team, also expressed his disappointment. Reacting to the HCI reveal, he said, I feel like with this Sonic here, visually, the important thing to look at is the head and body ratio and the roundness of the abdomen. I wonder if they couldn't have balanced them a little better. The soundtrack was composed by Tom Holkenborg, better known as Junkie XL, who'd also composed for Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, Mad Max Fury Road, and The Dark Tower. Holkenborg had also worked with Miller on Deadpool. He was excited to work on the project, as he felt that Sonic had a different tone to the films he'd worked on previously. The trailer for Sonic the Hedgehog was finally released on the 1st of May 2019, 
for a projected November 8th release. It was met with negativity and hostility, with much of the criticism stemming from Sonic's more realistic humanoid design. People were put off by the defined muscles, human-like teeth, and separated eyes, with many feeling that the character looked uncanny. Other criticisms were leveled at the choice of soundtrack. Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise was considered a poor fit for the subject matter. Rolling Stone's Claire Schaffer described the song as one of the most somber, meditative anthems on gang life ever to be recorded. The serious, meditative subject matter made for a poor fit with a film about the adventures of a cartoon hedgehog. Paramount was allegedly confident about Sonic's design, comparing it to the likes of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Transformers. While both films' designs for the main characters upset longtime fans, they weren't altered and still managed to draw in a large audience. Paramount expected the backlash from the fans, but did not expect such a negative reaction from the general public. This perhaps explains why they were willing to delay the film and make changes. Following the backlash, Jeff Fowler announced on Twitter the following day that Sonic's design would be reworked. The decision was received positively, with even Sonic Team alumni weighing in with praise, but it also led to concerns that animators and visual effects artists would be overworked to get the film out the door by the deadline. To alleviate concerns, Fowler tweeted again on the 24th, stating that the movie would be delayed in order to make the changes while avoiding harmful crunch. Accompanying the tweet was an image of a gloved hand holding a sign with the new release date, 14th of February 2020, Valentine's Day. The style of this picture led some to speculate that Tyson Hess might be involved with the redesign. Hess had been involved with the Sonic franchise for a while, and was famous for creating the parody comic Sonic's Big Fat Adventure. He started work on the series proper with covers and interior art for Archie Comics' Sonic the Hedgehog, before moving on to work on the pre-order trailer and opening animation for Sonic Mania. Subsequently, he was brought in to direct the Sonic Mania Adventures and Team Sonic Overdrive shorts. Soon after the first trailer's reveal, Hess tweeted a painting of the movie's Sonic design that he'd tweaked. Many considered Hess's take more appealing than the way Sonic appeared in the trailer. The painting style also resembled the image shown on Fowler's Twitter. Hess had indeed been brought in to work on the new Sonic design, which took around five months to fully rework. In an interview with fan site Sonic Team Argentina, animator Max Schneider stated the redesign process began with Sonic's face. The team compared the design shown in the initial trailer with modern Sonic and tried to find a happy medium between the two. Redesigning the character wasn't just a case of creating a new model and then applying the animations. A new rig had to be created based on the new design, and then everything had to be reanimated using that rig. Some old animations were able to be salvaged, but many had to be animated from scratch. Most of the movie was already finished by the time the first trailer launched, and so the reanimating process took many months. Although rumors circulated that the revisions raised the film's budget by $35 million, the figure was actually much lower possibly being fewer than $5 million. Schneider also stated that the animators weren't overworked to complete the job on time. Puma had made a deal with Sega to create a collection of footwear based on Sonic, with this footwear also appearing in the film. While in his original design, Sonic wore Puma Speed 500s, the redesign chose a pair of shoes that more closely resembled Sonic's classic footwear, the Dare Slip-On Sneakers, colored red and white. The redesign was unveiled in a new trailer on the 12th of November 2019, and was positively received. Ex-Sonic Team staff had a more positive reaction to the revised design as well. Yuji Naka wished there'd be a version of the movie with the old design, and expressed dissatisfaction that Sonic's eyes were still separate. However, his overall impression was much more positive, and he felt that it looked a lot more like Sonic now that he was wearing his gloves. Hess's involvement was confirmed when he tweeted a painting of the revised Sonic design, stating that he was honored to have been brought in to work on it. The positive response was poisoned somewhat by the announcement that moving picture company Vancouver, the studio behind much of the reanimation, were shut down soon after their work on the movie wrapped up. The shutdown, which was first reported as a rumor by Cartoon Brew, was revealed to employees in an email that was leaked on Imager. The email informed the staff of the studio's immediate closure due to increasing external market pressures in Vancouver. Reports of the working conditions were less rosy than had previously been reported as well. According to an anonymous member of staff on Reddit, the announcement came after staff had finished working on two infamous projects, presumably Sonic the Hedgehog and Cats. The user claimed that staff had worked multiple weeks without rest and regularly had to work 17-plus hour shifts, sometimes three or four days in a row. 
The user also stated that it was very rare for people to be working less than 10 hours a day. If staff didn't want to work overtime during the weekend, they had to give a satisfactory reason or it would be deemed an unauthorized absence. Allegedly, staff unwilling to keep up with this relentless work schedule would be replaced with people that were.